everybody on the East Coast, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Guidance on Preparing a Data Management Plan. Um, the reason that um, we are, I'm waiting for my slide to advance, let's see if it's going to go. Hang on one second. Amy, go ahead and click over on the slide and then try and advance. Okay. There we go. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Um, the motivation for the webinar today, of course, is um, the um, ongoing interest in data sharing in the social sciences and the other sciences more generally, um, specifically coming to mind as both NIH and NSF um, are requiring data sharing or data management plans in grant applications. I'm not forwarding again. Okay. Um, so the first uh, policy that has implications for the content that ICPSR has developed on this topic comes from the National Institutes of Health. Um, beginning in February of 2003, NIH required data sharing plans for large grant applications, that is applications requesting at least $500,000 in a single year of direct costs. Um, for those research projects, uh, data sharing plans are required. Um, there have been a few limitations to the data sharing plan requirement from NIH uh, that are worth mentioning. One is that the data sharing plan itself has not been part of the peer review process at NIH, uh, but rather handled by the administration of, from grant officers at the National Institutes of Health. Um, and the other important, um, uh, the other important uh, requirement has been that it has been a nice definition of timeliness in terms of when uh, research data should be shared. And the NIH uh, requirement focuses on um, that the main findings be shared from a final research project um, when uh, the findings themselves have been accepted for publication. So the timeliness of data sharing has been an important outcome of the NIH data sharing plan. Um, for the National Science Foundation, um, of course, we've got a new requirement um, for the preparation of data management plans in all um, grant applications. It's a requirement for a data, ma data management plan that is up to two pages in length, and um, this isn't something that impinges on other page limitations, so it's in addition to the, to the current grant application. Um, and this is going into effect uh, in mid-January right now in 2011. 2011. Um, this differs from the NIH uh, data sharing plan in that um, this plan itself will be um, subject to review. Um, we've gotten some early guidance from the National Foundation in a variety of ways on what a data management plan should look like um, and what to include. And um, that guidance generally falls into two categories. One, uh, a good description of the data that are being collected needs to be described in the data management plan, and then the actual plan itself for managing the data. And that's really what um, ICPSR has been focusing on in terms of determining uh, guidance to help people with this part of the requirement. Um, so today, um, I'm going to show you um, some screenshots of ICPSR's data management plan website. Um, and talk a little bit about how and why we developed it. And then really the bulk of this webinar is going to be focused on um, the various elements of, of a data management plan that ICPSR believes should be there um, based on um, the process that, we, uh, that I'll talk about in a few minutes of determining what should and should not be in a, in a data management plan. In addition to um, going over each of the elements of a data management plan, I'll give some example data management plan language. Um, showing different ways that you can meet the requirements of the data management plan. And then for each of the elements giving um, information about um, if you choose ICPSR as a data archive, um, what text would look like that you could include for each of these elements. 
And then finally, um, because we've spent a lot of time um, combing uh, the internet as it is, uh, we've determined and created a really nice list of additional pointers and resources to other places where you can go for more information. And so I'll just show you some of those. Okay, so to start, um, where do we stash our information on the data management plan? Um, so this is a screenshot of uh, the ICPSR homepage. And if you look along the top bar, you see the different options of how to navigate through the content of our site. And under um, the third tab, which is Depositing Data and Findings, you'll see the drop-down box includes, and I've got a red arrow pointing to it, um, the data management plan selection, which will then take you to um, this website. Uh, so here we have our guidelines for effective data management plans. And from here, I'm going to delve into talking about the various um, ways that we determined which content uh, to add to our data management plan site, um, how we did it, and then the actual, um, like I said, elements of the data management plan. So I'm going to leave the screenshots of our website and go on to the content. Um, but I do want to mention who at ICPSR has been involved in uh, the creation of this data management plan guidance website. Importantly, Mary Vardigan headed that effort, um, both in terms of the content development, but also in terms of um, publishing that content to the data management, plebs, data management plan website with her team. Um, Elizabeth Bedford conducted an environmental scan that I'll mention that looked out to see what others were doing with respect to data management plan guidance. Um, and that happened under the data preservation group here at ICPSR. Um, and when you actually want to use and um, talk to people about how to write uh, data, management, data management plans with help from ICPSR, um, you'll come and find me in collection development. Um, so this is a table that's available from the website. The bar across the top shows uh, the various websites that we reviewed as we looked at um, the, in our environmental scan and looked at um, what other people were doing in terms of providing guidance on how to prepare data management plans. So, so those are some of the key things that we search for um, in the internet. Uh, the rows then list the various elements that each of the websites we looked at um, recommended being part of a data management plan. And so then if you follow each of the rows across, it shows which of the elements are very popular across all of the websites. So for example, the data description is something that's recommended by um, all of the various websites that be included in a data management plan where others um, uh, were recommended much more sporadically. And so, um, I'm going to move on to talking about these elements. The elements that either everybody agreed to, um, I'm going to wait for, uh, I think my slide hasn't moved forward as quickly as my talking. Um, the first element that, was rec that we would consider highly recommended, and that is um, an element that um, most of the, um, most or all of the other websites also recommended is data description. And of course, that comes directly too from the um, NSF guidance that we're beginning to see as well. Um, um, in, a, in all, um, in terms of the highly, the highly recommended elements, there are eight elements that um, we think that data man management plans should cover as a priority. Um, and so I'm going to talk about these eight, li these eight highly recommended elements first. Um, so for each of the elements, I'm going to give an example or two about what kind of text might be written, and then I'm going to show you um, the text um, that we're recommending that you include if you choose to designate ICPSR as the archive. So first here, data description. Um, the data description is obviously important to include because it will help reviewers' understanding of the various important characteristics of a data set. Um, its relationship to existing data and any disclosure risks that might apply to the data collection. So all of those things can be included in this um, section of a data management plan. This first example here describes a large-scale public use uh, data set that will be produced. And so you see it has elements of both um, the size of the, the data set and, um, and ultimately whether it can or cannot be something that would be available to the public. Um, the second example also describes a data collection that's a nationally representative um, sample, but also mentions the sensitive nature of the data, and then, of course, the need for using um, a restricted use data 
agreement to disseminate the data. Okay. Um, so here is the text for um, if you're planning to submit a data collection to ICPSR, if you're helping a researcher prepare a data management plan and they think that ICPSR is the right home for the data, um, this is the kind of text that could be included. Um, of course, still the description of the data collection that's being gathered, as I already talked about. But then adding something like this that says that the data will be submitted to ICPSR and that they fit with all right, all, and they fit within the scope of the ICPSR collection development policy. A letter of support describing ICPSR's commitment to the data as they've been described is provided. Um, so an important thing to point out here um, is that um, for those intending to give data to ICPSR and to other, other archives as well, um, it's something that should be discussed with um, the intended archive before the actual um, application is actually constructed. So it's good to have these, these conversations early. Um, and if you have a conversation with ICPSR, we're certainly willing to, and we find that there's a good match between the data set and the collection here at ICPSR, we're willing to prepare a letter of support describing um, the fit of the data collection with ICPSR, which, which I think helps. Uh, the next element, access and sharing, is important to include in a data management plan um, to specify how the data themselves will be accessed and shared. And there's a lot of documents different options here. Of course, one is archives, but there are others as well. Um, but really, the importance of this element um, can be shown in various studies recently that have shown that um, data sharing, and specifically data sharing through formal avenues like archives and repositories, lead to data being um, um, both cited more widely, um, which Gary King has found, but also to more publications in and of themselves, so more um, primary and secondary publications um, result from data when they've been shared widely. Um, another part of this element that can be described in the data management plan is the timeliness of when the data will be made accessible to um, others outside of the research project or the research team. Um, and that's um, uh, another part to this element that can be included. Um, so the first example that I gave was um, when data are intended for a specific data archive. This second generic example um, talks about uh, or provides text about um, wanting to disseminate data through one's own website and not necessarily use a data archive for the dissemination. Um, and so the specifics of that are included in the text here. It talks about um, the technology of the underlying content management system that might drive the site. It might provide some justification for why um, the researcher is choosing self-dissemination. And so in this case, it's saying that um, a lot of content will be added by other researchers who come to the website, and those kinds of things will be captured. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important um, to mention here that in addition to sort of this immediate access that's going to be going to happen through self-dissemination through a website, um, that there will still be a copy that's um, preserved in some way, and that's a recurring theme throughout some of the other elements that we provided text for. Um, in this case, um, it's possible to also include some text here that talks about um, the eventual deposit of a data set with a repository and provide some justification for why um, the data might not be made available through an archive right away, but rather on some kind of a delayed dissemination agreement, or others refer to this as an embargo. Um, so that's also ideas of text that can be included here. Um, this fourth example um, talks about um, what is um, increasingly an option for people, which is depositing research data from the project, not necessarily with an archive or a domain-specific repository, but rather on their own campus in the institutional repository of the grantee's campus. And so if that's the case, um, this might be some appropriate language to include. Um, and here, um, I'm going to show you the various texts that we have available from the website if you are depositing with ICPSR. Um, and this talks about um, the long-term access to the data being accomplished because you're giving it to ICPSR. Um, and then here, um, the ICPSR um, access policy is kind of um, uh, 
spelled out in a briefer way that you might include in the application. Um, of course, access for public use data files is determined and um, defined by our terms of use, which are referenced in this text. Um, it's also possible that access to files be handled through restricted use agreements, and that's also specified here in the text that we have available. Um, and then we um, wanted to include something that discussed the issue of timeliness, because we've determined that's an important dimension of this element. The research data from this project will be supplied to ICPSR um, in a timely way, is, the, is what the text essentially is going to say, um, before the end of the project, while people are still using um, the data and are around to answer questions and transfer uh, the data and the documentation to ICPSR or potentially to a different archive um, if you're adapting this text for other uses. Uh, delayed dissemination is possible through ICPSR, and we have a delayed dissemination policy that can be referenced um, that uh, data can be disseminated um, at a later date, as long as that later date um, is justified and not longer than one year in length. The next highly recommended element of the data management plan is uh, that uh, the issue of metadata be discussed. Catch up in my notes. Um, good descriptive metadata are essential to effective data use. Metadata are often um, the only way uh, that um, there's communication between the secondary user or analyst who's coming to the data and the data producer or researcher who collected the data. So um, metadata must be comprehensive and provide all of the types of information needed for analysis. Um, structured or tagged metadata like XML format of the DDI, the Data Documentation Initiative standard, are optimal. Uh, because the XML offers flexibility in how you can display these kinds of things and also um, its uh, preservation, it, it meets all the preservation standards. Um, so this first example is highly ideal and uh, describes this, that metadata will be um, uh, generated using the generated in compliance with the data document, docu documentation initiative. Um, uh, a second standard that um, we've included an, ex an example for is the CDISC standard, and the CDISC standard is similar to the Data Documentation Initiative, which is um, pretty the DDI being prevalent in the social sciences. This is prevalent for clinical data and common for cl clinical data to follow the CDISC standard. Um, so that's a second example. Um, in terms of um, ICPSR, this is the language you can use if you're depositing your data eventually with ICPSR. It references our adherence to the DDI standard, and um, it includes um, information about the study level descriptions that ICPSR will prepare uh, related to um, any studies that uh, we receive and um, accept to archive and disseminate. It also references our adherence to um, a data citation standard, and also to create a direct object identifier, uh, and that is a permanent way to identify a data collection and um, that will always be located at um, the given U URL. And finally, uh, variable level documentation that ICPSR will create as it tags uh, variable level information that can be displayed in our social science variables database. Uh, and so on, which helps people discover and find data that they're interested in collecting. So all of those are pieces of the text that one can include here. Okay, the next element, um, oh, there's two more parts to the metadata, my, my, my apologies. Um, also, uh, our adherence to creating technical documentation that the variable level files um, The variable level files that are described will serve as a foundation for the technical documentation or codebook that ICPSR prepares, um, and also that um, we have related publications that become part of the, the study record itself, um, publications that are related to the data set and how it's been used. Okay, now on to intellectual property. Um, in order to uh, disseminate data, archives need a clear statement from um, the researcher collecting data about who owns the data. 
Uh, typically, the principal investigator's university is considered to be the copyright holder for um, any data that uh, the PI generates. And uh, this first um, example that we provided makes this clear. The PIs on this project and their institutions uh, will hold the copyright for the research data that they generate. Um, in this instance, in addition to describing the ownership of the data, it also includes um, uh, the fact that most archives don't require a transfer of copyright to accept data, but rather request permission to preserve and distribute the data, and that's what um, ICPSR does, uh, as do most of the other um, domain repositories in the social sciences. Um, so here are the research data um, they generate, but we'll give redistribution rights, and you can specify which archive um, you choose to give those to. Um, another element um, that may come into play with respect to intellectual property rights comes from the instruments being used to collect the data that may have bearing on how the data themselves are managed and shared. Um, so property, copyright may also come into play if copyrighted instruments are used to collect the data. In these cases, data producers should initiate discussions with archives in advance of data deposit. Okay, moving on to the ICPSR version of this text. Um, principal investigators and their institutions hold the copyright for research data that they generate. Um, and um, as I've already mentioned, by depositing with ICPSR, investigators do not transfer copyright but grant ICPSR permission to redisseminate the data and transform the data as necessary to protect confidentiality, improve usefulness, or facilitate preservation. And these are all part of our deposit terms at ICPSR. Uh, the next element is, the, is related to ethics and privacy and spelling out in the data management plan important issues related to these. Uh, the protection of human subjects, of course, is fundamental to all research and an important ethical obligation for everyone involved in research projects. Disclosure of identi identities when privacy has been compromised could lower participation rates in future studies and negatively impact science, as we've seen um, from time to time. So one of the most important considerations is whenever possible, researchers collecting data should not include language in an informed consent that prohibits data sharing. And so we thought this was one important element um, or one important piece of text that could be included when um, covering this issue in um, a data management plan that's being written. For this project, informed consent statements will use language that will not prohibit the data from being shared with the research community. Um, this is specific language. Um, it's similar to the last um, example, but actually shows some language that you can include in the data management plan that will be also used in the informed consent itself. Um, and that is that the information in this study will be used in ways that will not reveal who you are. You'll not be identified in any publication from the study or in any data files shared with other researchers. Your participation in the study is confidential. Federal or state laws may require us to show information to university or government officials or sponsors who are responsible, who are responsible for monitoring the, safe, monitoring the safety of this study. So here is an, act, an actual piece of informed consent language that could be referenced right in the data management plan. Um, this example pertains to HIMPA information being collected in studies and how that might be covered in a data management plan. Um, and here's the ICPSR text, uh, which includes how the informed consent should be written. So again, not limiting um, data sharing in any way. Uh, it also talks about ICPSR procedures to minimize disclosures and to protect confidentiality that are just part of our routine data processing. Um, so it includes um, a rigorous review, making modifications to the data, such things such as top coding, and um, combining categories, all the things that ICPSR does to data to protect confidentiality. Um, we also, from time to time, limit access to data sets uh, using restricted use agreements or our data enclave in place of public use uh, data set creation um, to, protect, to protect confidentiality. 
um, and we certainly do this all in consultation with the data collection, data producers themselves. So these are all things that can be spelled out in a data management plan that's using ICPSR. So data format is also an important element of a data management plan. Depositing data and documentations uh, and documentation in formats preferred for archiving can make both the processing and release of data faster and more efficient. So this is an important part of this. If somebody's using an obscure data format, it may be difficult for any data archive to process or use. Um, and also may be something that um, is hard to maintain over time. Um, and we also here um, think that it's important that preservation formats should be platform independent and non-proprietary to ensure that those kinds of information and data are usable in the future. Um, so here is um, something that sort of echoes um, ICPSR's um, thinking of some ideals, which is um, perhaps a, a quantitative survey data set that's um, uh, a SPSS system file that it has DDI compliant XML documentation and that even though that's the storage format that the data are distributed in widely used formats including um, ASCII, SAS, SPSS, and STATA. Um, the documentation and how they'll be handled, handled is also mentioned in this text as well. Um, there's a lot of different formats though beyond the quantitative data set. So this is an example of um, digital video data, um, but at the same time we have, uh, I think, a number of examples for other kinds of formats, audio, textual data, those kinds of things that you can find from the data management plan website. Um, uh, but MPEG-4 format is an emerging standard for dig digital video that's considered something that um, is easy enough to maintain, so we've included that as our example here. Um, so for for ICPSR, um, our, our text covers our preference in what format to receive the data in. It can be um, SPSS or SAS or STATA. It can be Excel. It could be something comma delimited, et cetera. Um, so those are our, um, our recommended formats for giving data to ICPSR. And at least for quantitative data files, we've listed here then the types of um, access formats that we provide. Um, in terms of both the data and the documentation. And then we also have our preservation data formats, which of course for quantitative data is ASCII, along with the actual setup files for various statistical and software pass packages. Um, so this is text that can be included um, if designating ICPSR. Um, so the, the next element is archiving and preservation. Um, digital data need to be actively managed over time to ensure that they will always be available and usable, and this, is, this element speaks to that idea. Um, this is important in order to preserve and protect um, this enormous investment that the public makes in science that um, we as researchers make in our projects. Uh, the preservation of digital information um, is certainly something that um, is considered to be both difficult and requiring ongoing attention over time. Um, relative to preserving paper formats and older formats of data. Um, depositing data resources with an archive can ensure that they're curated and handled according to good practices in digital preservation. So being able to say things along those lines, I think, are what um, meeting this um, element of a data management plan is all about. Um, so by depositing our data with and then naming the repository, our project will ensure that the research data are migrated to new formats, platforms, and storage media as required by good practice. So that's a good generic piece of text to include when, um, when that is one's plan. Um, so this is um, a piece of an example when you're planning to self-disseminate how to still meet this um, requirement for archiving and preservation. ICPSR has done a lot of research into how people archive their data when they're self-disseminating. And people always tell us, oh yeah, we archive the data. And typically what that means is that they archive their data by making a copy on a hard drive somewhere. Um, and so of course that's not what um, sort of best practices or ideals in terms of archiving and preservation would mean. And in the end, it also means that data are lost. So um, to sort of combat uh, that tendency, 
we make the rec recommendation and some text that says, in, in addition to dissemination through one's own website, that the data, at least a copy of the data, will be placed into a repository um, of some type um, that has um, policies with respect to digital preservation that will actually safeguard the files and keep them um, available over time. Um, the ICPSR text highlights um, our long history and track record with having done this, of course, um, and our commitment, uh, current and future, to migrating data to any viable future formats that we determine that we need or technologies, storage formats, all those kinds of things. So the migration plan for um, data sets, the ICPSR archives. It also describes our succession plan for our entire collection in the event of um, ICPSR itself failing. And so that's an important part of um, making a, a preservation commitment to a digital object that we think is important to include in the data management plan. Um, in terms of the uh, the final element to include in the data management plan, that's specific text regarding um, how data will be stored and backed up. Um, I think digital data are um, fragile, um, and uh, the best practice that's um, been determined through research has been that um, it's important to store them in multiple locations. Once one has multiple copies in multiple locations, it's important to keep all of the copies in sync with one another, um, given that digital um, objects degrade and erode over time. Um, so we have a piece of text here that um, describes this as um, an ideal way to say how data are being um, stored and backed up. Um, that is that um, uh, by placing your data in a repository, a master copy of the data file will be available. Um, but that there will be several copies secured at designated lo locations and synchronized in some way. And here we've specified um, a popular way that um, this is being accomplished in the digital world, which is using the storage resource broker, which is a piece of technology. It's called the SRB. Um, certainly that's uh, the standard that ICPSR is um, adhering to. Um, ICPSR uh, places the master copy of each digital file into our archival storage, and uh, that is replicated, and um, several copies are stored with other partner organizations in various locations, and there's a way to synchronize all that. So we spell that out um, for a potential reviewer of the data management plan if ICPSR is being named. Um, there's just a few uh, a set of optional elements. Some of these, I'm going to run through them um, a little bit quicker so that we have time for questions. Um, and I'm going to give, I think, just one, one example for most of these. Um, it may be possible that in your data description you've already covered how the data set relates to existing data and other data sources. Uh, but if it's not been covered, it's an optional element that um, also could be included in the data management plan. And this is important to specify when either the existing data um, is unique and different from anything else that's been collected before, or perhaps it's actually, in the second example, um, an existing data collection that's actually part of a long line of, of studies that have been conducted and just simply represents um, a new contextual period or an update of things that have already been done so that we can understand how different social trends unfold over time. Um, so um, examples of how to write this, whether um, one's data are first time ever or part of um, a long line of data sets. And here, um, because these don't have um, we don't have ICPSR examples for these um, um, less recommended elements. Uh, so the next element that might you might consider covering is uh, data organization. This is important to describe situations where research data are um, some way in, are in some way atypical with respect to how they'll be organized. So when it's something unusual, it might be worth including this element. Uh, so, for example, some data collections are dynamic. Uh, they're constantly changing um, over the course of the study and beyond. Um, and we certainly talk uh, at ICPSR with investigators who have um, dynamically changing data collections that it's very hard to actually deposit something with an archive. Um, so if that's the case, um, it's important to discuss 
um, the version control of um, the data collection and how, um, how and when it's appropriate to um, make static copies of the data collection and how they'll be preserved. Of course, quality assurance can be important. Um, and there's an example here. Uh, producing high quality data, of course, is essential to the usefulness of the data set. Um, and it's certainly important to be transparent with respect to data quality measures um, that one takes across the data life cycle, both during data collection and during um, when one is disseminating and, and preserving data. Um, so this is another optional element that could be included. Okay. Um, the security of uh, data files, it may have been covered in other ways, um, in other elements of the data management plan, but if it's not, um, it may be important here to include information about how um, data will be productive and processed. Um, so for this example um, that we have here about security, it says the data will be processed and managed in a secure, non-networked environment using virtual desktop top technology. Um, and that's something that um, ICPSR is uh, moving towards, and so we thought it was a good example of how, um, how security requirements might be met for um, the processing of data. Um, we talked about the ownership of data under the intellectual property section. Um, but it's important here to talk about who's actually responsible for managing and maintaining the data collection. This is especially important to include um, if, for example, there are um, multiple PIs of a data collection, maybe those two PIs span two institutions, um, and so which of the two PIs is actually the responsible party with respect to um, the creation of the data and then the data management um, plan and who would be um, acting as the steward for the data in those instances. Some of the um, plans that we looked at um, around the world uh, recommended including information about the budget. And um, including information about the budget may happen in the budget justification, of course, but it may also be important to include in the data management plan itself um, since it's a single place to put together all of the different pieces that have impact on um, the long life of the data collection and how to achieve a long life of that data collection. Um, so for example, here we have that staff time has been allocated in the proposed budget to cover the cost of preparing data and documentation for archiving. Uh, the archive has estimated their additional cost to archive the data as being with a dollar amount. Um, and this fee appears in the budget for this application as well. So it will echo anything that's appearing in the budget and the budget justification, but specific and highlighting um, data, data management. Um, some data have legal restrictions um, that impact data sharing. So for example, data covered by HIPAA, proprietary data, uh, data collected using uh, copyrighted data collection instruments. So some of this relates to things that I've already talked about in some of the other elements. Um, but it, and certainly if it's not been covered in other, in other areas, it's important to discuss how these issues might impact data sharing and describe uh, this fully in the data management plan. And this example is a HIPAA example. Um, some, uh, some of the plans that we reviewed or some of the guidance that we reviewed um, talked about defining the audience of users, and um, this may be important to include in the data management plan. Um, I think it might be especially important when the audience is um, something beyond the typical academic community uh, that may be interested in, in high users of the data. So for example here, um, it talks about um, who's going to be interested in, the, into, in, interested in a data set on family formation, uh, which is um, to be expected. Um, but then in addition to the research community, we expect these data to be used by practitioners and policymakers. So if that's the intention of the data, then that might affect how the data themselves are being shared and managed. And so um, putting that in um, is an option. Um, not all data need to 
need to be preserved um, in perpetuity or for um, the very long term. Uh, so think, thinking through the proper retention period for a data set may be important and um, this is the right place to include it in the data management plan. Um, so when there are reasons that the data will not be preserved permanently, so for example, if the informed consent was done uh, with children and that the data themselves cannot live past the children turning 18 without reconsenting the children as adults, that might be a justification for why the data um, uh, uh, will be kept until the children in the study turn age 18, for example. Um, it's also possible that there's reasons why the data collection is an ideal candidate for permanent preservation, and so that's also important to specify. Okay, so that's all of the elements of the data management plan that we've thought through and our best um, suggestions on uh, how you can think about those things as you prepare data management plans or help people prepare data management plans. Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots of some of the other resources that we have available on our website where you can go to look for more information. Um, so coming right from our data management plan website is a set of other resources to go to and we've broken those down into um, resources for developing plans, sort of a more conceptual overview of, of how to think about data management plans. We also have um, a set of um, templates and tools uh, that we point to that you can go to um, to see how to prepare a data management plan. Um, there is certainly guidance that's emerging from uh, the actual funders themselves and um, the data management plan requirement has been um, very has been um, popular uh, in the UK and in other places and so you'll see that there's um, guidance on fun guidance from funders um, in this section here. Uh, there are um, lots of good university data management websites that have um, been cropping up and um, we point to those in the next section. And then kind of um, websites sort of similar to ICPSR, which is guidance on, how to, on good practice and how to write data management plans. So kind of the practical nuts and bolts um, the websites that are listed here. Um, in terms of data management plan examples, there's a lot out there, but most of them refer to the natural sciences. And we have a list of those that you'll find um, from our website. And finally, um, we've begun to assemble a bibliography on um, where to go to read more about data management issues, so actually the scholarly literature and what it has to say about um, data, management's, data management issues. Okay, so just um, to wrap up here as my, as my last slide, um, in addition to reviewing ICPSR's website materials, um, you may want to, if you're thinking about um, involving ICPSR in um, a data management plan, certainly contact us to determine um, whether the data collection itself may fit within ICPSR's collection. And it might be obvious um, or it might be not obvious. Um, but starting this discussion earlier rather than later is always uh, better. Uh, you can certainly request a letter of support for a grant application, whether it's NIH or whether it's NSF. Um, we certainly, um, given the NIH requirement um, dates back to two, 2003, have um, prepared, prepared letters of support for grant applications. Um, but again, um, we need some time to do this, so the earlier the better. And we'll do this when uh, we determine that the data collection is a good fit with ICPSR's collection. Um, and finally, um, if you want to involve ICPSR further, you can determine um, if there are any costs to archiving data with ICPSR. Um, and this is something that um, we're still working through, but we think that um, there are certainly reasons that ICPSR would uh, be an actual um, line of one's budget. Um, when data are particularly complex, when uh, the audience falls outside of ICPSR's typically, typical audience of members, when um, the data collection itself might be more tangentially related to ICPSR's collection development policy, policy those kinds of things. Um, so again, to determine if there are any costs to archiving with the ICPSR, um, contacting us earlier is better, my resounding 
um, my resounding phrase. Um, so I'm going to put up here on the last slide, and will be part of the slides that are available for download, my contact information. Um, so if you do want to involve ICPSR, if you have other questions about um, creating a data management plan that may not even involve ICPSR, you're more than uh, welcome to use me as the starting point at ICPSR to talk about these things. Um, so you see my name here, my email address, and my direct line. And with that, I will end and open it up to questions that I think will be read by others here at ICPSR who've been accumulating these things. Um, hi, Amy. This is Arun <coughs> and, and, uh, at ICPSR, and I will be reading the questions. I've, first, let me say there were so many that um, we'll prepare a special FAQ to address what we don't get to here. And um, I have tried to group them, so I'm, I'm, I'm mostly going to read them as in the order they came in, but, so I'm not facing any or putting any judgment on uh, any question of the importance of, the, of it. Uh, the first um, area that looked uh, uh, was about copyright. Several people have said that, um, that the uh, data are generally not copyrightable, but that the instruments would be. So do you want to clarify that? Right. Um, so the, it's true that the instruments are copyrightable, but not the data themselves. Certainly other elements to the data documentation that are, that are actually produced. So you might produce um, a really nice fancy version of a code book that I think is copy, copyrightable. Um, but um, I hope I wasn't misleading with that. It's still that section is pertaining to um, ownership over the data collection, and that typically resi resides with the um, institution that received the funding to do the data collection with some kind of relationship to the PI to act on behalf of that institution in looking out for the data. So that's typically what happens. Next question. Um, okay. Um, uh, so some people say that they've been uh, told that the plan should focus more on the proposed methods of preserving and sharing data rather than a statement of institutional capabilities. Is that, is that true? Yes, I think the things that we're seeing from the National Science Foundation suggest that to be true. Um, and I think that's why we've included the examples that we've included. And perhaps as um, we got started, some of the earlier examples looked more like institutional capabilities and less like the other. Um, but certainly, we thought it was important to spell out um, for those wishing to use ICPSR, um, sort of what happens, what happens to the data, the life of the data when it leaves one's hands and enters the ICPSR, um, the ICPSR world of both dissemination and preservation. Um, so we've strived to make it not read like um, an institutional capability statement and rather addressing the real concrete issues related to um, preserving and sharing data. Okay. Uh, any suggestions specific to the NSF International Program? Uh, let's see. Um, I certainly ICPSR um, uh, accepts and preserves data that are collected um, internationally as well as nationally. So um, that's certainly something that's in scope for us to help with. Um, if if that's the question. I'm, it's kind of a vague question, so I'm not sure how to answer that. That might be something that um, whoever asked that question might choose to follow up with more specifics uh, with me directly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how, do, how would we protect the confidentiality of participants where anonymity is impossible, like uh, videotapes of couples interacting? Right, so in those instances, um, the 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 key issue isn't, um, it, it might be blurring the, the facial expressions or blurring the identities of uh, the people in the video. That's certainly one possibility, but not a popular possibility since it kind of obliterates the emotions of people, which somebody might be also interested in with respect to looking at the videos and coding things. Um, so really then it's a matter of restricting the access. So um, restricting the access by um, um, sharing it with a restricted use agreement, restricting the access by 
um, designating a closed location, requiring a data security plan so that when uh, the data might arrive to a potential user, the data are um, secured and not put on in a networked environment, but rather used on a standalone um, personal computer or something like that. So those are the kinds of elements that um, might be discussed is the restriction in terms of access instead of the restriction in terms of the data themselves. Okay. Um, when people place their data on or in an archive, do they receive authorship on papers that result from the use of their data? Uh, how do we ensure that overlapping findings aren't published? And does NIH or NSF offer any guidelines on how to manage these issues? Um, so typically, um, typically uh, the archives and the social sciences, and you know, I welcome you know those from other disciplines to share their stories, to share their examples, uh, both with ICPSR, so that we can make our website richer. Um, but certainly in the social sciences. Um, uh, the original data collector is not guaranteed authorship um, once the data are um, shared through an archive, and that's, this is certainly true of ICPSR. Um, so once you give the data to ICPSR or one of the other social science repositories, um, people can use the data and publish from them um, as they see fit as long as they meet the data, the data use policies of, um, of the archive. Um, and then in terms of making sure that um, uh, people don't sort of do overlapping work, well, I think sometimes overlapping work is, is good, right? And so that's part of the cornerstone of science is moving along incrementally, redoing things that others have done to some extent. But ICPSR's answer to that, and I think it's common uh, th throughout other archives, is to keep a list of, um, of um, articles and books that have been published in, our, in a bibliography that people find when they find the data. So they find the data and they get all of the things that have been published so far that they can add to rather than um, duplicate what's already been done. Okay. Um, have you seen proposals rejected because of an unacceptable data management plan or do agencies work with the PI to improve this if they find the project proposed worth funding? I don't think we can comment on the National Science Foundation as yet because it hasn't been implemented. Um, certainly uh, with respect to the National Institutes of Health, um, I think we've seen that rather the, the second option, that is that people, uh, that, that program staff work with um, PIs to improve their plan if the plan is some way inadequate going in. Um, but with NSF, it's seeing that it's a review criteria. It may be more important to get it right the first time since it could go against an application. Again, this is in theory. I can't say how it will be um, implemented in, in practice as yet. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, does ICPSR have people who can assist in the preparation of the metadata, putting it in proper form and so on? Does, will NIH and NSF allow investigators to request funds to pay for data archiving, assistance in preparing data in the final year of the grant, I guess? Um, obviously, we do prepare metadata here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we certainly prepare metadata. I think also we're in the position to advise if people want to know how to prepare metadata following the DDI standard. There are some software packages that are available that we could recommend to you if you want to do it yourself and still use some kind of a self-dissemination method. So even if the data aren't going to be um, deposited with ICPSR, um, we might be able to help with that. So I just want to point that out so that people um, think to come to us to get recommendations on how to prepare metadata. Um, I guess in the, what was the second, there was a, it was a two-part question at least, wasn't it, Arun? Yeah, um, I think it's about uh, how to, about requesting, can you request funds to pay for this, or how does right. this part get paid for? Yes, and um, certainly, um, I think for both NIH and, and certainly true for NSF, um, you can certainly put um, preparation of data files for um, eventual public use into, into, the, into, the, into the budget as a line item. You can have personnel devoted to doing that or to do, devoted to doing that and other things as oftentimes people wear multiple hats, but it's definitely part of uh, the budget justification. Um, and then with respect to any cost that the archive itself might charge, um, I think that 
um, the word that we've heard is that those two will be allowable costs from the National Science Foundation. Okay. Uh, do you have any recommendations for intellectual property language for proposals that are collaborative between two or more PIs at two or more institutions who will be generating the data together? Um, I think that's a great question. I think we dealt with that a little bit at the end, which would be... Sorry. Um, <laughs> Oh, right, right. No, I, I, cause you, I'm sure you're collecting those as I was talking, and it was something that I just mentioned at the end. I'm not sure I can say much more than I already said, which would be to make sure the data management plan um, outlines that, um, but it's something that you might have to seek um, advice from um, your own general counsel about um, about how the data are, are owned or co-owned across the universities. I don't know if any others if here have comments on that, knowing more than I know. Sure. Um, is data encryption a recommended part of preparing data security? And do we offer encryption of archived and disseminated data? I'm not sure. Um, well, for ICPSR, we typically don't, in part because um, when people are using our um, sort of our online deposits and things like that. Uh, we have an online deposit system that people can just upload data to ICPSR. Um, usually data are, are de-identified at least to a degree at, that, at some point. Um, and I think the answer of whether we should, whether encryption procedures should be spelled out kind of relates to um, the, the collection itself and what it needs. So for highly sensitive data, data that has highly sensitive information and some indirect or direct identifiers that are known in the data files, then encryption is going to become more important. Um, so really it's just a, a customized um, issue and maybe that's something that we can provide additional examples on as we um, invent the next version of our content on our website. So I thank that person okay. for that question. Sure. Um, where one's institution has its own management plan or system, should would you recommend using that plan or going through the ICPSR system? I'm not sure what that means. So certainly there's um, many universities have their own institutional repository that might be a, 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 a viable home for a data collection as opposed to putting it with a domain repository like ICPSR is, and there's certainly examples in lots of disciplines, disciplines of sort of um, archives that service the discipline or their domain as opposed to the institution where the PI is sitting. Um, so there's that difference, and I think it's whether um, the institutional repository where one sits has um, a commitment and an understanding of the kind of data that they wish to deposit. If it's that um, the data are, are, are best understood by a domain repository like ICPSR, then it's more appropriate to give it to ICPSR. And it's certainly possible to give it to both. Okay. And I don't it know is that getting... was exactly that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, since it's getting late, I think I'll just end with this last question. Um, can you name the software packages with regards to DDI that you mentioned earlier? Uh, uh, Mary, do you want to do that? Make, no, Collectica and, yeah, sorry. Sure, this is Mary Vard again. Um, so, yes, there are several packages in existence that help one mark up documentation uh, compliant with the data documentation initiative in XML format. And those include Nestar, uh, which is available at nestar.com, uh, Collectica at Collectica Dot com. Um, it's also the case that the Dataverse uh, data archiving system uh, provides markup to DDI, as does ICPSR as part of its um, routine uh, activities. Um, uh, there are also some systems coming online that use uh, relational databases that are compliant with DDI, and this is a rapidly changing area. So anyone who's interested should go to www.ddialliance.org for more information about tools, or contact us at ICPSR, and we'd be glad to work with you and advise you on this topic. Thanks. Um, okay, shall we end it?
That sounds fine, Arun. Thank Amy. you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so <laughs> much. And thank you for our virtually 500 um, attendees at one point. Uh, this, um, as uh, Linda said at the beginning, this webinar will be archived, and hopefully by the end of the day, there'll be a link on the front page of our website. And I guess we'll end it here. <laughs>